So hi everyone. So welcome to today's talk. So I'm happy to have my friend Matej Zelrik here to present his very recent work on neural causality. So I just say a few words about Matej before the talk. So I first met him at MPI 2 million almost two years ago. So when he was doing his master thesis with Stefan Bauer and Bernhard Shokov. So since then we have seen each other. So personally, I'm so happy to have the chance to see him again virtually. So, so now he is doing his PhD with Christian Kirsten at the TU Damstand. So today he will talk about his work on the relating graph neural networks to the structure causal models, which is a joint work with DeepMind. So as we know, both models offer us a general framework to deal with the structured data, especially the graph-based data. So it seems natural to build a bridge between these two models, but how to establish the connection is non-trivial, to which is the main contribution of the paper and also the focus of today's talk. So that's it. So now I give the stage to Matei. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Chao for this uh, amazing work. And it's also my pleasure to be here today and also be talking in front of so many people. Uh, these numbers, I mean, oh, roughly 150 now, it's, it's amazing. And uh, to really speak in front of all these fellow scientists and people. And um, yeah, it's a great opportunity also to see us again. And uh, I hope we will more often in the future. We'll start the talk now. So as I just told uh, Chao Chao, I, it's the first time also for me giving this talk now. And so I don't have an ETA now on, on, on how long this is going to take, but I'll have a look at the time and I'll try to um, have at least 10 minutes of discussion worth at the end. Um, but honestly, feel free to interrupt intermediately. I mean, personally, I'd prefer if we just flow through and then keep a nice discussion at the end, but I'm open to anything. So beginning with the talk now. So the title is Towards Neurocausality, Relating Graph Neural Networks to Structural Causal Models. And as you can see, it has kind of two, two notions to it, right? So, so this one thing, as Chao Chao suggested, it's that uh, we are presenting here our work. So this is going to be the main bulk of the presentation, but I'm also trying to make it a little bit bigger and talk about this new emerging uh, scientific direction of neurocausality and also give pointers at the end to some interesting work, at least from our lab, uh, that I can talk a little bit more deeply about. So without further ado, let's jump into it. So. A short summary, a kind of too long, did not read. So merging causality with modern deep learning is not futile, right? So it makes sense. And actually we collectively as researchers have already discovered promising directions. So if I want something for you to take out of this, right? Then it's that this is exciting and it excites me and I hope it will you too. So given that this is the uh, Chinese causal science community, I think everyone is probably involved already in causality uh, or, or at least very interested. So, so this is exciting to me also to speak directly to this community. So we start with chapter one, basically of this talk, why, right? So this wouldn't be a causality talk if we didn't ask the question why. And why? Well, recent attention. So as some of you have might seen on Twitter, we have uh, just based on this paper that we uh, submitted now, uh, got big attention actually. And uh, as you can see on the left side, Yuda Pearl, uh, commented that actually this paper deserves attention, which is obviously big words coming from the Turing Award winner. And also his, his former pupil, Elias, uh, was keen on it and, and was actually suggesting that it's a nice uh, kind of extension to their work on causal neural. And a lot of many other reactions, right? And, and I mean, this is just now from our side of things, but in general, regarding neural causal models, there has been a lot of attention recently. So, I think personally, this was a theoretical milestone. This work by Kevin Jia, Jai Jin Lee, Joshua Bengjo, and Elias Badenborn. So the causal neural connection, they call it. It's the two words just flipped around basically. And what they did, so, so you can find it in our archive. I'm also putting it like this here. And here's one figure out of this paper where it nicely shows, right? That they have this structural causal model, which stands at the core of, 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 of causality's concepts, which implies a causal diagram. And now you can use this thing to construct an NCM. You can construct basically a neural variant, a neural parameterization of a structural causal model. And then they, for the first time, went really rigorously into the theory and kind of made it work. But it's not the start actually, right? So there has been previous foundations. 
So if we look at work from Kuchaoglu et al. Uh, in, in ICLE 2018, we see the causal gap, for instance, right? So a generative model, generative adversarial network, um, where these networks components are basically, you know, the variable systems, right? And um, the other work, for example, by Rosemary Kay and, and her co-authors, -author uh, learning neural cosmology from unknown inventions, uh, actually already did what uh, Elias and the others did in their work by um, using neural nets to model these structural equations. Um, it's just the main difference that they really went into the theory afterwards. But here we already saw the first hints of it working. And please take all of this with a grain of salt. By no means this is a complete list. It's just some things I'm now collecting for the sake of this talk. So why? Right? So if we cite Yuda Pearl in his Book of Why from 2018, then he says something like, to build truly intelligent machines, teach them cause and effect. And I think a lot of people here kind of agree with the statement, right? And then there was this more controversial statement actually, which was in an interview with Quanta Magazine in the same year that, you know, all the impressive achievements of deep learning amount to just curve fitting. And so I wanna give my opinion at least on this statement. So on the one hand side, right? Also maybe being biased as a, as a causality researcher myself, in causal terms, this is absolutely a correct statement. But then again, you know, there was a lot of controversy going with it because I think it also diminishes, you know, all the great success we've had ever since with deep learning, right? You remember ImageNet, we remember AlphaGo, AlphaZero, and so on and so forth, right? And so, um, yeah, it's it's definitely something which gets the people talking at least. But let's maybe motivate also now causal inference, right? And and so let's talk concretely now about this per causal hierarchy, right? So so this is actually nicely depicted with this figure in the book of why. On the left-hand side, you see where you have these three rungs, these three layers, right? And, and you see, for example, this robot with an owl on, 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 on this first rung, and then you have this Neanderthaler and, uh, and the baby on the second, and then you have Albert Einstein on the third one, right? And so the first one is what we know as correlations, right? Association statistics. So, you know, you have a belief in X and how does it now change after observing Y, for instance. But now when you go to intervention, you get this active component, right? So you are actually changing it, right? And you're say, saying, okay, what would be X if I were to do Y now, right? And on the highest level, which Yuda proposes, you have these counterfactuals. It's like this retrospection. It's like almost like going back in time. It was a, say like, you know, um, was it X that caused Y, right? So, so, so what, if, what if basically, right? And it's a statement which nowadays also politicians and, and social science and everyone is pretty much interested in. And I think, you know, or, or you know, there's this um, work by, by Baron Boy Medal um, on this hierarchy, right? And, and again, theoretically, formally, and the theorem one, the main theorem they claim there is the causal hierarchy theorem, which basically, right, informally tells you, okay, causal inference will actually make sense most of the time, right? It, it, it won't collapse. And that suggests to you that basically you cannot go from layer one, two to layer one or layer three to layer one. You can only go in one direction. It's, it's almost like the arrow of time. But we can also take this motivation a little bit further. We can you know, come from a different perspective. We could ask, what would be if not, right? And so here what we see, this is an example which also Yuda likes to give. On the right-hand side, you see this, this plot, you see exercise on the x-axis plotted against the cholesterol levels on the y-axis. And you just fit this correlation model and you would think now, okay, well, doing more exercises amounts to more cholesterol, isn't it the other way around? And actually our intuition is true, right? Because if you now consider age, right? Which is kind of uh, acting as, as this uh, consolidation here, then you see that for any age group, it's actually the reverse, right? It's like you do more exercises and suddenly your cholesterol levels drop, right? So it's as we would expect, the causal effect is in that direction. Um, but yeah, you wouldn't see it actually if, if you didn't consider it. And I think that's what makes causality important. But there's also another example. So the camp around Jonas Peters and the others, um, they like to give this example, for instance, right? So what you see here now is the activity of two genes, A and B, plotted against the phenotype. And so the first row is A, the second row is B. And now you're asking on both the question, well, what happens if we go out of data support, right? Like we have data up here, but what happens if we set it to zero actively, right? We intervene on it. And so this actually highlights how important causality is, right? Because for gene A, it seems like 
the 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 the, the causal structure causal model looks like this, or, or the causal relation, right? So gene A is causing the phenotype, but for gene B there exists a confounder actually. So gene B is not causing the phenotype, and so for A you have to predict in this area, which would probably happen with most machine learning models because they would just fit a linear regression model here. But for activity on gene B, right, it would be completely wrong. And now imagine something very critical based off this. It clearly highlights how important causality is. So to define now, what is neurocausality, right? So I kind of define it just to coin this term maybe more formally because I haven't seen it maybe around, but I might be wrong. But I think it's the science and engineering of integrating causality with neural-based methodologies, right? And, and you can in general do this also with just machine learning, right? And then you have something like neural learning, right? And uh, I like to think of this akin as to the definition of artificial intelligence by John McCarthy, right? One of these founding fathers of AI back from the Dartmouth Mount meeting. And, and he's saying something like, it is a science and engineering of making intelligence machine, especially intelligent computer programs. And it's related to the similar task of using computers to understand human intelligence. But AI does not have to confine itself to methods that are biologically observable, right? Which is, I think, a very important distinction here. So with this, I'd like to start now with a little primer, basically, to get us all on as much of the same level as we can. So causal inference 101, right? So what we see here is the structural causal model, the SCM for short, right? Displayed with the C frac, this set of structural equations S, and then this uh, factorizing distribution over the exogenous variables, right? So these U terms standing for unmodeled basically or, or for noise terms, right? And um, these equations look like this, right? So, so for each of these variables, you have a specific function, which depends on the parents in, in, the, in the induced graph and some noise terms. And this is a Markovian SCM, right? So, so this is an assumption um, which basically tells you, okay, we won't have hidden confounding. It's a strong assumption. I'll come back to it later, but this is for now, right? So if you look now on the right side, you see three variables, for instance, and you see that the structural equation of, 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 of Y depends on X, Z, and a noise term for Y. And so now there's this important concept in causality, right? So if I change something, what happens, right? And this is known as the intervention, right? So you place these origin mechanisms for a set of variables um, and, and denote it by this, what is known as a do operator, right? You do it, you just change it, right? And it must not be a scalar. It can still depend, you know, on, 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 on the, the parents actually, it can depend differently, right? It's just a replacement. And now if we see here, right, it changes the graph. So basically you remove the dependence, right? You are now setting it outside kind of, of the system. That's why there's a kind of meta operator feel to it, right? And an important view and valuation is given by this formula, right? So you see that, you know, the probability of, in, in, in this causal model we are now considering of W when you do the intervention Z is basically a sum over all these nature terms, all of all these noise terms, unmodeled terms, for which uh, you know these, this equation will hold basically, for which you know the, the, the variables of interest will have seen that intervention. And so to give you some pointers, right? So I'll also um, gladly make these slides available afterwards. So you can really like look into these uh, pointers I'm giving here. So for example, obviously the causality book by Judah Pearl himself from 2009, uh, Jonas Peters, Jan Sig and Schulkopf had elements of causal inference 2017. Um, Elias has given a great lecture on causal data science in 2019, so you can watch it on YouTube. And there's also this great course by uh, Brady Neal on, on introduction to causal inference. Um, and also the Jonas Peters lecture series he gave at MIT, which is, um, yeah, I, I personally like that one really, really much. So now let's talk also about variational inference, right? So, so since we use this in, in our setting, um, so kind of similarly, actually, when, when, you, when you come from that way to causality, you have this uh, assumption over these unobserved but relevant variables set, right? And, and they jo jointly model your phenomenon, right? Your, your observed data X. And what we do here, opposed to, you know, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods and whatnot, we do optimization to get the posterior, right? So the posterior is this PZ given X. And we have now this variational family Q, for example, a mixture of Gaussians, and now we are trying to, you know, minimize in terms of KL divergence, right? We, we just find the member, the parameterization, which is closest to the posterior. And, you know, if you do the maths, it turns out, you know, that the, the evidence you, you, you have there is actually intractable because you have this latent variable here, which you're trying to integrate over, which is not, not good. 
And it turns out you can get a lower bound, right? You can get this evidence lower bound on, on, on the uh, marginal likelihood, log likelihood. And uh, since this term is always positive, it is indeed a lower bound. And so you turn out with this setting, which we know from variational autoencoders, which are a neural parameterization to this problem, right? So, so basically you have this, this reconstruction term on the left side from this expectation of your, of your data. And then you also have this regularization term, which note now is not the posterior, but some prior use set, right? Again, as for causal inference, I have some pointers to some, some, some relevant literature and, and, and also lectures. So we have obviously Wainwright and Jordan in their book from 2008. We have David Blay with a really nice review for statisticians. Um, but in general, anyone can look at it. Um, then Philip Penick gave a lecture in Tübingen on variational inference. And then there's also very nice cool blocks with code and everything um, on the variational autoencoder. And now finally, in our primer, I want to look at graph neural networks, right? So, so they are kind of the, the thing we, we dived in, in deep, right? And which Petal is our expert for. And um, so graph neural networks plays this inductive bias on graphs, right? And in essence, they are a permutation equivariant application of permutation invariant functions, right? And they come in three different flavors. So there's this graph convolution network, graph attention network, but there's also these message passing networks. And you see there's the subset, subset equal relationship. So the message passing ones are the kind of best ones in the sense that, you know, they, they have the, the, the best capacity to learn, but they are also not the best ones because obviously it's going to be harder to learn those, right? In terms of optimization and different problems. And so the most general formulation is given by this, right? So where H is now this new encoding you'll get after this GNN computation for a specific node I, um, which is based on the data or the features of node I and, and an aggregation over the neighborhood, right? Of these messages basically, right? And, and here a short illustration where you see it, right? So for each of these neighbor tuples, you'll have this message you're computing. And so here again as well, pointers to GNN references. So Petra has a really, really nice lecture at Cambridge recently on theoretical foundations of GNN. Um, there's been now this recent book, right? By Bron Bronstein, Puna, uh, Cohen, and, and, and Velichkovic on, on, on geometric deep learning. Um, and there's also this very, very amazing talk at ICLE, so you should definitely check it out. And then again, there's also a lot of tutorials on GNNs nowadays, which is really, really cool. And with this, we now get to the main meat of this talk, which is now about our work, right? So, so this will kind of focus on. So this third chapter is going to be about GNNs, NCMs, and SCMs. So again, as a reminder, here you have nicely our pictures, right? So, so me, Matej Zetjevic, uh, Devendre, uh, Peter, and Christian. And it's on archive, so most of you have probably seen it by now. Um, by no means, this is now a, a, a complete guidance to really all the technical nitty gritty things of the paper, but um, it's, it's definitely a supplement. But for details, for questions, I mean, you can always, always check that or, or contact me. So we started from first principles, right? So, so we are asking, we go back to, to Peter Holland and Don Rubin, right? 1986. And there's this big statement, you know, no causation without manipulation. And Actually, it's not true, right? So as identifiability suggests, you know, like do calculus, adjustment formulas, whatnot, you have, have these formulas like this, right? So the, the probability of Y doing X is the same as summing over this conditional times the prior, right? And this basically is a powerful statement, right? Because this is this adjustment in this case, right? So it's, it's showing now for, for the right-hand side. And um, it's basically telling you that you can actually express your causal quantity, right? So everything from layer two onwards is causal, right? Interventional and counterfactuals in terms of statistical ones, right? Given the knowledge on Z in this case, or the knowledge actually on the structure. So you see on the right-hand side, two uh, SCMs, CFRAC1 and, and CFRAC2. And what you see is that, so this interventional one is the same as the conditional one, which is not generally the case, but in this case, because note that the one is with respect to uh, SCM1 and the other to SCM2, right? So if we were to take to SCM1 again, it's not the same thing, right? Because if you look at this formula, what would happen is basically that Z would also depend on X, right? And they would exchange information. But yes, what we definitely agree with and, and why what probably makes the statement very important by Holland and Rubin is that interventions are very important, right? So they are at the core of causality. So we asked ourselves naturally now, right? So, so what does it mean to intervene on a GNN, right? 
And so we looked at the SCM. And so now you see on the left hand side, this SCM, right? This unobserved nature here for four variables. And you know it implies the PCH, as we know from, from Badenbaum's work on, on the, the, the layers, right? So the observational, the associational, and the counterfactual. It implies obviously data, right? So you can sample for data if you query the nature for these unmodeled noise terms. And you can obviously read off the graph structure, right? And this was kind of the vector to attack, right? The point of attack we chose, right? We, we said, okay, the graph is the common ground with GNNs, right? So, so let's maybe exploit the similarity. And so this is essentially what we did. So here you see in one slide, kind of the core idea, at least on, on, on this version of neural causal models. So you see a, 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 a dark on the left-hand left side from, from the previous SEM, and it's this, um, it's, it's basically a GNN, right? So you have this computation here, this permutation equivalent computation of this permutation invariant function. But now what you do is, uh, yeah, do with, this is indeed a pun in this case, you have these neighborhoods and you delete now the edges to the parents, right? It's, it's very simple in this case. And it's actually the same way it happens in a structural causal model. And so we can also now write this down more formally, right? So an intervention X on a person set of variables X of, of all your variables V, within the GNN layer F, um, denoted by this F then do X, is defined as this modified layer computation, right? The formula we saw earlier, where the intervened local neighborhood is now given by this neighborhood where the parents of the intervened node are not considered anymore. And this we'll generally just call interventional GNN, right? Or, or an intervention within a GNN. So naturally, a question which arises is concerning layer three, right? Level three, so counterfactual. So definition one allows definitely, you know, to go beyond L1 to L2, but what about counterfactuals? What about the full PCH, right? And so thinking about this problem, we realized, well, there's more to it, right? So these messages that the GNN is passing in its formulation, you know, when you look at these structural equation dependencies or causal effects, right? So all of these terms, all of these edges in the SEM, then you actually can do a full conversion between SCM and GNN. And this was kind of the first theorem we, we posed in our paper. So, you know, consider this most general formulation of a message passing GNN, uh, this node computation HI, and then for any SCM, there exists always a choice of these feature spaces of these functions and of these shared functions, such that any structural equation in your set will actually be mapped correctly. And so this was very cool, right? But there's catches to it, like with most things, right? So, so what does theorem one not talk about? So it is a direct conversion from SCM to GNN, right? Theoretically, it's solid. We provide the proofs, and I'm not going into details for that, as I said earlier, but please feel free to check the paper for it. But you know, it establishes definitely this GNN as a neural causal model variant, right? But theorem one does not talk about optimization, right? So if you look closer, then you realize, you know, one way to construct it is that you basically map this message function, which is shared for each of the variables in the structured equations, right? So you'll have all these dependency terms, right? X, Z, Y, Z, Y, X, and so forth. And, and this is kind of the more fundamental problem, right? So the message computing is actually shared notion, and this probably also gives it a lot of power, right? But what about the structural equations? What about, you know, each of these variables, right? I mean, an SEM is actually a big description, right? I mean, and so, what would happen now? So this was now again a follow-up question we had. What would happen if we violate the sharedness properties? What if this psi, these messages, they not have to be shared, right? And so what turns out, we actually get something which is very, very close to the NCM which was defined by Baden by 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 Chia and, and, and the others, right? So um, it is actually a neural parameterization of an SCM, which is capable again of the full PCH. But it models on the edge level, right? So, so really, what will happen is, you know, you allow for, for this violation of sharedness, and now you'll model each of the dependency terms. And so, it's really just a special case of the NCM defined in in this recent work that I marked as a theoretical milestone. And so, just to bring this point home, right, to kind of illustrate also the difference between the two last I mentioned, right? We have the NCM, so. You know, we use separate neural networks to model each structural equation, right? So it kind of grows in the number of variables. And then we have this, what we call NCM type two, right? So we use the same thing, but now we model the causal relation tuples, right? So we grow in the edges, 
which is obviously a lot more complex, right? But then again, it also has a lot of advantages probably because, well, it's it's more interpretable, right? You can look at these simple connections, right? It's, it's more transparent, right? And that's why we argue in our paper that it's actually worth in future research actually to investigate this direction, right? So kind of, you know, also in analog to, to how uh, Petter usually defines the, the three flavors, what he calls of GNNs, uh, it turns out, you know, there are also three flavors of GNN-based neural causality, right? So on the left-hand side, you see these three models we now discussed. So the IGNN, which will eventually be the IVGAE, I put it in parentheses now here because it will come now, the SCM-GNN conversion from theorem one, and from corollary one, the NCM type two. And we can kind of classify them in terms of expressivity, uh, you know, in terms of the per causal hierarchy, the training difficulty, right? So, so, so how easy, how difficult will it be kind of to optimize this thing and also the cost, right? How complex is this? How, how much resources are we taking based on, right? So, so this is a rough kind of classification here, but what we see clearly is that, you know, while both these latter models are able of the complete PCH opposed to the IGNN approach, they also come with a cost, right? So, so the middle one is, is by far the most difficult to go about. Um, the latter one still has a lot of resources that it's taking, um, and that's why essentially, you know, we choose to go in our research with the IGNN. And there's also another important reason, actually. So maybe the bigger reason, actually. So, you know, from the neurocausal viewpoint now, this model is actually very, very interesting, right? So it trades off expressivity against model description. And it's kind of the first neurocausal model, which is, you know, not um, uh, actually an SEM. Right, so so that's that's very exciting, and so you know it 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 basically cuts off on the counterfactuals while kind of still being true in a sense to to you know what causality talks about on the other layers, and uh, it trades it against model description, it, it, model description in terms of compression, right, in, in terms of how much you need to kind of describe the model, and so with this we jump into chapter four, so GNN based causal inference, right, so we take now this IGNN, and we'll continue and do causal inference and look at the theory very in line and very in spirit. And that's why it's a, an extension, in fact, to the work of the others. Um, yeah, on, on, on the perspective of the Pearl causal hierarchy and the causal hierarchy theorem. So let's see how we can now construct GNNs from causal graphs, right? So this is actually very straightforward, right? So any SCM will actually imply a graph, a causal graph. And this very graph now, right, um, or an estimate of it, doesn't really matter. You can use to construct the GNN layer. And this is what we define in definition two, where we just say, okay, this one will be the adjacency information you incorporate basically into your GNN computation. And following now definition one, it turns out, yeah, well, the way we defined it, the intervention is very natural, very to the way it occurs in an SCM. This was also pointed out by Yuda Pearl in his tweet, actually. So, if we have an SEM uh, with a causal graph, this GFRAC, and uh, the computation layer of this FRAC GGNN, then you know, doing an intervention will produce the same graphs on both. And this is easy to see in proposition one. But now we have to go further, right? So, so usually we're, when we talk about these models, we talk about generative models, right? So, so they can create data, right? So, I mean, it's the data generating process. And so we look at causal generative models in this case, based on IGNN, right? And so we therefore look for which ones we can take to, to you know, parameterize with this model from definition one. And naturally what comes, that's why the primal and variational inference, well, the variational autoencoder, or actually as, as Kip van Velik did it, you know, the variational graph autoencoder. And so definition four defines just the general variational graph autoencoder on data. So opposed to their works, we are actually reconstructing the data and not you know, using it for graph embeddings. And then in definition five, you can finally do the IGNN based VJE, right? So you can say now, okay, my VJE, right? If I use IGNN layers, then you can call this an interventional VJE, IVJ for short. And note what's interesting here is that actually both the encoder and the decoder will be IGNNs, which is something which has only recently been started to, to get used for, 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 like, for example, the uh, neural relational inference and, and in these works. So here, to, to make it a little more spicy, look at the IVGA, right? So on the top, you see the IVGA, on, on the bottom, you see a structural causal model, a classical one, and there you have these multiple modules, right? So, so this should really bring this point home, right? You have these multiple modules, these structural equations, 
and now you query nature and you get your uh, probability of, of the data doing Y, right? And the variational graph autoencoder, the interventional one, it's just two neural nets, right? So it's just this F and G, right? And both of them are these IGNNs, right? So these graph neural networks capable of interventions. And now you still get the same thing, right? And I mean, simply from this, you can kind of see this, what I pointed out earlier, right? This model description and change for expressiv exp expressivity, right? So, but yeah, how do we measure actually this cause expressivity, right? So remember, IVGA are not SCM, right? So it's kind of the first neural web variant or, or it's not the first, so I have to correct it. I mean, the causal GANs, right? You can also classify them actually in this framework. And this would very be very interestingly be something to look at theoretically. But it's 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 one of these models which is first now pushing into this theory upon you know this formalization by uh, Chia and the others. And so it trades expressivity against model description. So now we have to define a sort of agreement, right? And, and Chia and the others did it. Here we have to do a different definition. In fact, it's one of partial nature, right? Because the model has this restriction that its strength will eventually depend on, on the data you see. So basically for any model M capable of you know, partially emitting PCH, right? So this is very general. So it does not only apply to IVGA, but maybe also to things like causal gamma or whatnot, um, that for the first two layers and an SEM, then it's partially consistent this let's say IVGAE with respect to this causal model, if you know it can agree on a subset, right? Then it must be kind of the same subset. And note, you know, that for example, the observational distribution will usually just be one distribution, but interventions, I mean, they tend to infinity, right? You can just, I mean, just by the nature of, of, of continuity, right? You could just have scalar mappings from the real numbers and, and, and you basically go to infinity. So now let's talk about the strength of just GNN-based causal methods, right? So you can pick any SEM of your choice, right? So this is great, any, any SEM. And now there will definitely exist a corresponding IVGAE, which will agree on an arbitrarily large, right? And this is the important point, right? So the subset could just be one distribution, but arbitrarily large will depend on your data and your, and your, and your optimization of interventional distributions, which naturally includes the observational one. Right, and so this is just what is state, stated by theorem three. And then following from that, we can also now define the causal hierarchy theorem for IVJ. Right, so so Barenboim et al. in their work they they proved C CHT, and as I said, it kind of ensures the causal inference still makes sense. Right, so going from one layer to the other will just work in one single direction, and generally be you know impossible in the other direction unless obviously you introduce some additional information like partial knowledge on the SEM, be it the graph or something else. And so in Corelab 2, we kind of now prove this for this IVGA model class, right? And we do it with our partial consistency, which is really just telling you, okay, if you have these, these two pairs of, of models, right? So SEM and IVGA from, from their respective spaces and, you know, this, um, this, this, this implication from going from one layer, if they agree on that one, to the other layer in this partial consistent setting P and Q, um, then this will, this will pretty much never be the case, right? So now will co collapse basically. But let's also talk about weakness once again, but this is actually something we already talked about. So we are incapable of counterfactual reason, right? So, so layer three is kind of blocked, the door is closed, we are shut out, right? So we trade indeed this expressivity against this kind of compression we are seeing, right? So, so we will not find a model of this type, at least of this specification, which will be, you know, uh, L3 consistent in this case. But now let's turn to the question, what about practical causal inference, right? So as I said, for the first time, we kind of inspected the neural model, which is not an SEM, right? So as I said, I mean, there have been earlier works, right? Also by Kozogan and the others, but this is one now from the theory standpoint, which is really pointing out as not being a, a proper NCM, but really, you know, modeling the, the causal hierarchy, at least partially. And so, you know, we consider now the, the causal power, but let's also think now about practical causal inference. Let's talk about these other important problems actually you face in causality, even also coming from a theoretical standpoint. So this short chapter five is going to be now about identifiability and estimation. 
So again, a short identifiability 101. So I really want to bring home the point that these two terms, identification and identifiability, although they look very similar, I mean, they have the same, you know, the, the prefix and everything, it's uh, actually two different processes, right? So identification really means that we try to go from this causal quantity, right? So the intervention to in terms of statistical ones, right? So this is the things you do with do calculus, right? So this uh, algebraic manipulation, right? The symbolic manipulation. But the identifiability is it's kind of a step before, right? It's asking okay, the question whether causal quantity is actually statistically expressible in the first place. It turns out, as we saw at the very beginning, Markovi and SCM, given the graph and observational distribution, um, are actually always identifiable, right? So, so you can get any intervention quantity via the adjustment formula, right? But as we also said already, right, and unfortunately, you know, macrovanity is too strict, right? So, so we practically assume that never we observe, you know, like, I mean, we never observe all relevant factors, right? We cannot, you know, simply, or we should not at least for practical purposes, assume that we will always know all the variables uh, of the system, right? And that hidden confounding simply doesn't exist. Right? This is actually another thing which at least Chia et al. and these others are, are doing very greatly. And we are still considering in the future, right? We, we still made this assumption to establish these three kind of models we've been discussing so far. And so it turns out actually for neural identifiability, right? You actually still have to make a theoretical point before we can dive into the practice, right? So um, you have to establish this kind of equivalence in identifiability, right? So if you look at SEMs, you can pick any two SEMs that agree on L1 and the graph, and then they have to, you know, agree on L2 as well, right? So, so they cannot disagree. You cannot find a different description which will disagree, right? And this is also something which, by definition, needs to hold true for the NCM, right? So it needs to kind of parallel. And that's basically what is happening here in definition six, right? So we are saying, okay, let's again, omega and, and, and gamma be the sets of SEM and corresponding fract GGNNs based IVJEs. Then for any pair we choose, you know, a causal effect is called neural the, the, the fair if and only if the pair agrees on both the causal effect and observational distributions. And note that given that we chose frac G to be the graph of the, of the respective uh, structural causal model in the pair, um, this is also set here. So really, this is the only way we'll hold true. And what Chi et al and, and the others did basically was they, they used this to you know, have this kind of um, max min optimization and, 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 and through this, find out about identifiability in neural causal models. And for us, basically, it turns out it's the same thing. And this actually we also can prove, and this we do, right? So we say that neural identifiability is still preserved. So, you know, Perl's do calculus is, is provably um, giving us any identification. And um, as she et al, and we prove, this also achievable with neural causality, which is very exciting, right? So, so any qu query Q, right, which would be, you know, this interventional effect, causal effect you're trying to model, um, will be also identifiable from the IVJ, right? So, so we kind of don't lose anything there, right? Obviously, we are not talking again on how to get there. This is, again, in principle, but we are getting it. But let's now, to kind of finalize this little, look at estimation, right? So what you see here on the left side now is uh, the, the AJ data set from 1988 from, from the Royal Statistics Society, uh, Lauritzen and Spiegelalter. And uh, what we see here is we are now, on the on the left side, we are we are showing all these variables, right? And 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 they are all um, um, Bernoulli distributed, right? So so we have really just the probability of of of, of zero and one for the specific variables. These are the marginal probabilities. Um, also color coding them, right? So here we have Asia, here we have Bronk, Disp, and so on and so forth. And on the right hand side, we now have the interventional one, right? So so basically, we're cutting this edge, right? And, and we are now querying, okay, what happens if you know we we make um, the, the top variable be uh, uniformly distributed, right? Bernoulli half, right? And we see that, you know, as shaded here in, in this kind of olive color, it's propagating, right? It's propagating through this causal hierarchy, um, this, this effect, right, on, onto the descendants on either on X ray and disk. And here in this example, you can actually nicely see, right? So you see this, this very, very extreme first variable now, which kind of has this very same extreme effect on these other ones on, on green and purple and, and also on orange. And now it's, you know, kind of making them also again look similar, right? It has a very strong causal effect on them actually. And, and here it's actually flipping even, you know, like the, the prediction. And so 
this model adequately kind of captures it, it captures right so the intervention point as expected but also captures you know this causal influence ideally right because we want to model this new distribution so now to kind of also conclude right with this talk right so chapter six is neurocausality onwards so a short recap for you to, to know what we saw. So we collectively as researchers are now tightening this integration of causality and ML. And uh, as I pointed out at the very beginning and, and multiple times throughout, there's been, in my opinion, this theoretical milestone by Chia, Lee, Benjo, and Barenboim on these neurocausal models. And we extended now this law, right? So, so, so Devendre, uh, Peter, Christian, and I, we extended this law by these three new neurocausal approaches so the IGNN IBJE from definition one and five, right? Coming really from first principles. And then also what we developed, I mean, which we didn't expect to be honest, but like which came out of it naturally, the SEM GNN conversion, which is hard to train, very hard to train. And the NCM type two, which is, well, takes a lot of resources, but is actually very, very worthy of investigation for future research. And obviously we showed these feasibility, explosivity, and also identifiability results while also providing at least some little insights on, on how this performs in practice with estimation. So how can it go further, right? So, so I tried to make this talk a little bit bigger than it is uh, just about the paper. So talking about this neural causality. And so regarding only our work, I'd say, well, we could look at different formulations for definition one, right? For defining the intervention. Um, but we can, you know, we could have like, uh, for example, you know, information actually about the intervention and code it. This, if, if for, for, the, for the keen reader might have noticed, right, this is not actually in there yet. Um, but we could also consider, you know, the generative model, which is based on the IJN, right, from definition five, we chose the VGA. And so I can imagine definitely that, you know, we could get to this complete PCH, right? So we add counterfactual, we break through, um, or we just get more efficiency. Um, very importantly, and, and I think also like my, 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 my lab colleagues will agree, you know, that, you know, practical scaling and also deployment in downstream tasks, right, as we have seen from works at the MPI, for instance, um, in Tübingen, right, with the, with the robotics platform and all these things. So, so there's a lot, a lot of um, room for, for, for pushing there. And, and I think we should definitely do this because um, at the end of the day, right, so what gets us probably all together here and this hype, um, uh, around deep learning or all these uh, exciting kind of sub communities ML um, have been these successes, right? Like always following an IA winter into an IA summer. And I feel like we are still going strong nowadays. And then what actually personally me excites most is kind of, you know, ex exploiting these causal properties for, you know, unresolved mysteries of deep learning or, or in general machine learning, to be honest. So interpretability. And so now, as I point out at the very, very beginning, a kind of appendix, this Z, the separate chapter, just to kind of a little bit advertise also what we've been doing, but in general, just point to you cool directions I find, which I'm at least involved in and, 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 and trying to push out, you know, for, for this community to grow and, 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 and progress. So in general now, not just, you know, neurocausality, but like causality for machine learning. So this is one of our recent work we've now uh, pushed on archive which is called Intriguing Parameters of Structural Causal Models. It's again with Devendra and Christian. And what we do here is we kind of, you know, want to go in these unscathed areas, right? So, so causality has been in a lot of places lately, right? But there's still a lot of room to go, right? And what we do here is optimization. And transitively via optimization, we also go to adversarial attacks, right? So just to give this short example, so here you see again our SCM, and now you see this SEM, right? we have this, this, this health property, we have a prioritization for vaccination, which depends on this health property. But then there's also wealth, right? It's a confounder, right? And you can see it in the data. And now what we did, our trick basically, what we established from first principle theoretically is this connection to an LP, to a linear program, to a basically mathematical program formulation for optimization. And turns out now you can do a kind of adversarial attack close to tie breaks, so you see that this blue W and this red W hat, they look identical. They are not identical, but they are very, very close to each other with regard to some epsilon. And they'll do a matching, which for the optimization problem will in cost be correct, right? But now you see on the red one, which is the adversaries one, that suddenly only the wealthy people, right? 
are getting vaccinated, right? And this is obviously not an intention of the original model. And so I find this very exciting. I mean, this work could have very important implications, you know, for, for anything, right? So it, it is also very in line with the spirit of how of Pearl is, is phrasing things that, you know, we have to think about our assumptions, right? We, we have to think outside the model. Then this is also another work. So this is a bigger co collaboration with the colleagues from uh, UT Dallas. Uh, so with also with uh, Atresh and Sriram. And here we define, we look at causality for tractable models, right? So tractable probabilistic models, you know, which are SPNs, some product networks, which are, you know, uh, linear in inference in the size of the network. And um, here basically we looked at, well, what happens if we can kind of provide maybe the, the do operator, this meta operator in a neural fashion, right? So, so with the goal in mind, at least, you know, to make it differentiable eventually, right? And have basically a tractable model capable of modeling, you know, generative distributions. So it's kind of like the IBG in this case, right? But with a tractable model. Then a very, very preliminary work. So this is headed by, by Moritz so far. It's kind of, we're looking at this continuation of, of, of Chu et al. 2018, right? So the people from the Star AI lab with He Vandenberg and semantic loss valid under interventions. So we are asking ourselves, well, we take this loss, right? Which is this neurosymbolic thing, right? We are kind of combining good old fashioned AI with, with the power of deep learning. But now we are also trying to combine it with causality, right? And so this is very preliminary, but I'm very excited and definitely want to mention it here in the, in the causal uh, science community. And then to kind of wrap it up, this is the most exciting work to me personally, which uh, soon we'll, we'll put on archive, also together with Konstantin Rotkopf. And so this is about interpretability, right? So basically what we are trying to do is say, hey, all these neural induction met methods that exist out there, um, that model partially SEMs, causal graphs, whatever, they are in fact interpretable in a human understandable way. So you see, the SEM on the left-hand side, as usual, it can generate data, but you know, it also implies a graph, but actually also causal effects, right? So you could have uh, an average treatment effect estimator on it or any other kind of notion, the dependency terms, whatever. And now you see, we can ask a question, a why question, right? Very natural causality. We can have some individual, right? We call him Hans here, right? So he's an elderly German guy, right? And he has these properties of age, of his nutrition, the food habits, his health, the mobility. And now we're asking, well, why is Hans' mobility bad? And actually, it turns out if we now, in this case, you use the ground truth graph, we can generate a human understandable interpretation. We can say, you know, Hans' mobility is bad because of his, well, bad health, right? And why is that bad, uh, bad health there? Well, mostly due to his high age. He's an elderly guy, although obviously his nutrition is good, right? So, but age has a bigger effect in this case as, 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 as nutrition, as food habits. And so this is something where I'm very excited about. And, and, and uh, I would be honored if any of you were, you know, looking at this in the future. And so to really conclude this talk now, so um, to quote Yuda Pearl in his, his seminal book, right? So he said, as X-rays are to the surgeon, graphs are for causation, right? And I think this is a great statement. I like this quote a lot. And um, there's a lot of nuances to, these, to, this, to the statement. I think from today's perspective, I underlined the graphs, right? So we looked at the graphs, we use this kind of connection. And to maybe, you know, do my own version of it, I'm making a bit of a bold claim here, but I'm saying, okay, as graphs are to the causality, causal nets are for AI, right? And so with this, thank you very much for your attention and let's start our discussion. I hope we have a lot of time. Yeah, thanks, Made. So that was a wonderful talk. So I think perhaps the right thing to do now is to move on the discussion, given there are, I think the almost 200 of us and the 10 minutes left. So can I ask if anyone wants to ask questions, you just unmute and ask. So or type it in the chat box. That's another option. Any questions? So I, I do have a question here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, thank you very much for your great work. Uh, I read your paper through. I learned quite a lot. Um, when I was reading your, uh, your paper, I always have the question is, uh, what is, what would be the main advantage of um, establishing such a connection between deep learning and causality? 
So there's something, I think from the article, I got something um, probably because of the cross layer uh, reasoning, or there's something like uh, we could not do with the SCM, like um, uh, I think it's both the partially observed. For that part, uh, to be honest, it's not very clear to me. Maybe you can help me with that. Thank you. Yes, of course. So first of all, thank you for your very nice words. And now to go to your question. So this is a very important topic, right? So as you remember, maybe one of my first slides was this, you know, attention on Twitter, right? This kind of discussions, which actually you and Ilya started after seeing our paper. And it's very important, this discussion. And it's also, I guess, dear to Ilya's since um, they have done this NCM. And what is it about? Well, to also maybe use Ilya's word, but also give my opinion. So it seems, you know, it's, it's first of all, you know, I mean, just for the sake of the science or like, pure mathematics is, you know, pure mathematics, um, it might eventually, you know, give rise to more, but um, it's definitely just, you know, this hope kind of as well that basically you can do more, right? That you can, like the do calculus can do anything, right? But you kind of also want to move away from the symbolic, right? You have to want to have everything end-to-end -end learnable, right? You, you want to do it from the data. You, as, as, as kind of, you know, neural nets did it and, or deep learning, right? So you don't want to manually specify these things. You, you really want a system to automate, right? To, to, to learn on the fly, to do all these great things. And so I think this is one of the kind of core arguments of, 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 of doing it neurally, right? Or, or really trying to, to go that route in the first place. Um, sorry, can I uh, ask a question? Yes, of course, yeah. go ahead. Um, so I come from uh, an engineering background, so these uh, theoretical work is a little bit difficult for me, but um, I'm really excited to, to hear all these. And I'm just, just uh, curious about um, implementation though, uh, and so let's say I have a, a very big set of data consisting of um, events and their associations, and I have a rough idea of um, their their causality, but just a very rough idea from experts. Um, are, are we at the state of academics now that we can use deep learning to construct a, a, a causal network from this? And can it be um, iteratively improved as more data comes in, uh, like the online learning. Uh, yeah, that, that's my question. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you again also for the kind words and for these very cool questions. So this is causal discovery, right? There's structure discovery, I mean, a field which has been for a long time and then also with the causal notion. So um, yeah, I haven't been really touching upon that one here. But uh, it's certainly, certainly very interesting. So Eric Zing's group at, at CMU, for example, they did the notious one, which has these, you know, linear SCM kind of assumptions. Then you have like invariant causal prediction by, by Peters back then, right, which are, you know, doing these, they're using these different environments, actually, a lot of data in a sense, and then trying to figure out the true causal structure, actually, independent of a lot of other things. Um, you know, what I think personally comes a lot into play is this assumption thing, right? So. Basically, Markovianity, as we saw, is kind of a very harsh assumption in the real world. Um, but people are starting to move. So regarding your first question, kind of what's the state of academics? So people are starting to move there. And then again, also to answer this question, yes, we have already a lot of you know, methodologies to kind of you know, get you know, at least some, some estimates, right? And as you say, if you can actually provide um, a prior, right, like really by experts, and then refine, I think that would actually be a lot stronger already. So, so that's um, definitely a point. Also regarding the implementation thing, uh, I think you were saying, so um, yeah, feel free to check out the website or also the paper or the links in the paper. So we have code. To be honest, it's not the prettiest code yet. So, so it's, it's not that efficiently implement, implemented, right? But like um, time and space complexity wise, this is super fine. So, so this is a good thing, definitely. Um, and, you know, to give, you know, I guess, practical advice, I think you can definitely consider like these, these also like dips and, and whatnot. There's a lot of new um, methods. So if you're interested, feel free to contact me and I can, you know, maybe share some references with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I have two questions. First, uh, in my opinion, the, the key trend you will make to GNN is to assign an NLP to each age. Uh, the important feature of GNN is the message passing mechanism and parameter sharing. 
So my question is whether the SCM based GNN is actually an SCM that converts the each structure function into different MLP. That's the first question. And the second question is where the where are the counterfactual difficulties of this model? Yes. Thank you. Can can you maybe repeat just the first question? So the second one I perfectly got, but like just the first the essence, maybe you can rephrase it or okay, okay. I, I, I repeat again. Uh, the first question is uh, in my opinion. The, the, key, the key change you make to GNN is to assign an MLP function to each edge. But, but as we all know, the important feature of GNN is the message passing mechanism and the parameter server. So my question is whether, you, whether the SCM based GNN, which is, is your work, is actually an SCM that converts the each structure function into different NLP function. Yes, yeah, yeah. so, so if I understand correctly, sorry, then this first question. Um, mm -hmm. So basically you're referring to the NCM type two and it comes naturally from violating in a GNN the sharedness property. And as you correctly say, this is a crucial property, right? And, and, and that's why the SEM GNN purely is, is so difficult, but like with the NCM type two, at least you can, you know, like, um, it's, it's, it's this different thing, right? It's just, you know, you violate it. So indeed it's not a GNN anymore, right? So that's at the core of the GNN, but you actually come up with a new neural causal model, which is still sensible, which has advantages. So, so this is the one. And um, regarding the second one, I think it was regarding the counterfactuals. So, um, you know, the main challenges come for, for the IVJ in this case that you, um, basically have, have not this, so, so if you think of how this level three or layer three is being uh, evaluated, right? So you're querying nature for all these different kind of interventional worlds. Um, so you can imagine counterfactuals are basically nothing else as, you know, observing an SCM and then intervening in that observed state. So kind of you already have point mass put on, on these noise terms. And so um, it happens from this procedural generation of this, data generating process of the SCM. And um, that's basically the difficulty. We cannot model it, right? So opposed to having uh, a neural, uh, like uh, the, 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 the structural equations being modeled by each of the MLPs, we don't have that in that setting in the IVJ. We just have two MLPs basically, and we already try to do the best out of it. And, and so it comes from that. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, hello, uh, uh, good morning. So uh, my question is, uh, machine learning is kind of a um, data driven approach, right? And the uh, causal inference is kind of a uh, hypothesis driven approach. So when you design the deep causal model, so how to handle these kind of, you know, trade off questions, you know, right? Yeah, so if I had to put your question correctly, or, or, or at least the thought you were giving in the discussion, um, yeah, I think that's what, you know, like most people still have the problem with nowadays and causality. So, so I have quite a few friends who are working in computer vision and uh, they uh, have, you know, like this, this difficulty of getting in a sense warm with, with causality because, you know, it's, um, you know, you're doing these um, assumption, you're thinking of outside, outside the model, you're also very restricted, you know, usually to these smaller domains. I mean, they've been works on, on bigger domains, also even on images and these things. Um, but people have not kind of found this clear cut thing there yet. And I think this is at the, at the core as well of, of, of the problem, right? So I'm, I mean, these fields feel kind of very separate um, in the way they have been formalized and developed, right? And so it's now at us basically to, you know, as collectively as, as a community to, you know, progress the research. Uh, hi, can I ask for a quick question? Of course. Yes, thank you. So yeah, I'm kind of uh, curious about your last work is uh, the, the one with uh, interpretability. Uh, yeah, it's like uh, I heard about the uh, interpretable model, basically those models are stable, more stable than the traditional one that like deep learning models, so, so to speak. And uh, I'm curious about have you tried to test the model stability of your, uh, <laughs> the one you're building and on 
cross cross data set or other scenario that uh, so they basically not on the same. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. So so we yeah. have um we have not considered this experiment in, in this latest mm -hmm. webinar. It's I think very interesting, definitely, you know, going on the robustness route and stability. We have done something similar. So so what we have done is we have, you know, again from first principle, we we started, we motivated, we 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 continued and then you know climbed our way through the thing and and eventually, you know, we, we found this, you know, structural causal interpretations. That's how we call them uh, in its theorem. And then we showed that if you have them, actually, if you have interpretations, you can now uh, use them for learning. You can kind of reduce the hypothesis space, the search space of, of your learning procedure and, 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 and thus, you know, learn both faster and, and better on, um, yeah, with SCI. Um, but um, this one is certainly interesting you propose. Uh, we should think about this. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry for the interruption. So is there some question from yeah. the chat box? So maybe I can read for you. So I think one people asked, is it possible to discover the causal graph by generative GNN or we have the predefined graph? So I think this is pointing to also, you know, these neural relational inference and all these other works. So yeah, there have been a lot of works, you know, on, on the causal discovery from these generative-based models. I mean, the original also VJE, right? So, so that's obviously less or, or not about causality, but you are really learning, for example, these graph embeddings, these spaces, as I said earlier, also the node tiers, right? So you, you are really having this acyclicity constraint. You're trying to learn these darks, right? Which uh, usually the, the, the way we kind of define it, although there's a lot of work also on causality, you know, going beyond darks, with these bi-directed structures and so on. Um, but yeah, there's definitely works and 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 you can feel free. I'll, I'll also charge or share with you the slides, right? So people can go into the pointers and, and everything. Yeah, thanks. I think due to time limit, maybe we have uh, the last questions. Hello? Okay. Hello? Could Hello. you hear me? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, thanks for the great work, and it, it's really exciting stuff. Um, there are many. Uh, my my question is that uh, there are many papers trying to use the SM framework uh, uh, in in their machine learning. However, do calculus is rarely used except some work about the uh, back door, uh, front door, or adjustment uh, adjustment rulers. Um, so why assumptions of do calculus are not considered in uh, such papers uh, or in your paper? Uh, do you think it's, it is possible to combine the do calculus into the learning or inference of uh, our new network? And the second question is that, uh, uh, do you think that uh, unlearnable confounder exists? So uh, thank you, you very much. The second, can you, uh, thank you. Can you repeat the second question just? Uh... Uh, the second question is that we often trying to use um, uh, where is no method to uh, approximate a confounder and we can, we will put some uh, we will condition on the confounder to help us to uh, reduce their uh, confounding bias. Uh, but is there is there unlearnable confounder that we cannot um, model or if we use a new network to filter the function, it will introduce some um, unreasonable results. Uh, it, it's our second question, thank you. Again, thank you very much uh, for the kind words and also for the great questions. So to answer in a sense, or to at least give you know the, the pre-hand for, for both of these questions, I think that's the hope, <laughs> or you know, that's what we are trying to do with our research, right? All these guys uh, across the world, right, who are, who are focusing on this. So, um, so I think, and I, I, I believe we can, can, can do this somehow. <laughs> and um, so, regarding more specifically the first question, do calculus in, in neural nets, right? So, I don't know if we actually want, you know, like a proper do calculus within neural nets, but we definitely want its power, right? So, I think that's what we are kind of pointing to. But um, for, for the second question, um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of also what I tried to point out a little bit that, you know, this motivation at least, you know, is very, very similar in, in variational methods and in causality in that case. 
And I mean, confounding is a, is a big problem, right? I mean, confounders, I, I didn't define it formally, but it's just, you know, one variable pointing to others, a common cause, so to say, right? Um, um, and so, so um, yeah, so uh, I think there is a lot of works on, on, in this area, right? I mean, we have seen it just, you know, formally from two calculus and these things, mediation and analysis whatsoever. Um, but also, as you said, in, in variational methods, there also, again, the hope, right? Or, or you know, the, the, the push for being able to do this. That's why also I think Badenboim and the others have also, you know, started to ditch the Markovianity assumption to really have these, you know, also dependency between the unmodeled terms, right? This hidden confounding. And then, you know, leverage neural networks basically to learn it, right? So, so that you don't have to know it. And I mean, if you think about representation learning, for instance, right? You're also trying to, I mean, yeah, learn representations, right? You're, you're trying to find meaningful uh, kind of representations. And when you think of disentanglement, you're even trying to make them independent, right? So, you know, if you think of an object, the shape, the color, the size, all these properties. And um, I mean, people have done clever ways, for example, disentanglement, right? I mean, they, you know, have like, like in, in the VAE and then they have the regularization term, they put it on above one and, and suddenly, you know, they enforce the isotropic Gaussian, but it's still, it's still, uh, there's a lot, a lot to do. So, so I think we'll have, all of us will have enough work to do. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, sorry, Chao Chao, may I have the last question? The last, last one. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm fine. It's, sorry. It's, yeah. So, yes. um, hi, Matei. Um, a uh, great work. Uh, actually, my question has been discussed just before, but uh, um, here's my question: um, Are we ready to establish a framework to jointly learning causality and inference the cause effect uh, in one framework, especially under the context of graph neural network or other uh, deep uh, deep generative models? Uh, I mean, uh, jointly learning the causality uh, by a causal discovery context and uh, inference the causal effect uh, by causal inference context, uh, not by a uh, two-step, uh, not by two-step fashion. Yeah, uh, what do you think about it? Yeah, so I, I think, I mean, our work already is kind of doing this, right? And also like from Chia and right, they have basically, I mean, it's very kind of, it feels at least very preliminary. It's also very theoretical in, in our both works at least. But I mean, if you look at a Rosemary case paper, right? Which is doing the yeah. same thing they did, but you know, like in a, in a practical application for, you know, learning the structure and these things, then I think you're actually, um, yeah, or, already doing this at least partially. So. So uh, yeah, I think we are on a good way for this. But, but so far, um, as far as I know, um, now now uh, we first uh, we first do the first step. Uh, we do causal discovery by Dagian or Notius, and then we use that causal structure as our prior. And uh, as you do, we are uh, we move to the next step. We do causal inference on such priors. But uh, uh, I haven't seen uh, uh, any work that jointly do these two steps. Uh, so uh, <laughs> that's my question. Yeah. So you are basically asking also for the downstream tasks, I guess, right? Yeah. And I think that connects to the reinforcement learning as well. So again, if you look at Baran Bar uh, Elias' work, right? So the causal reinforcement learning. So there's also, I mean, Chao Chao can tell you a lot about this actually, because I mean, he has oh, yeah. worked in this, right? So so he has done the deconfounding RL signals and reward signals and these things. So um, yeah, I think we are also doing there a lot of work. I mean, even here, the people uh, among us, right, have, have been doing things like this. Um, but yeah, I, I think your question is pointing more to really this kind of end to end, you know, you also maybe deploy it, right? And it's just, but this is yeah. maybe, right? As I already pointed out in my quote at the end, right? I, I said, right, as, as graphs are to the causality, you know, causal nets are for AI, right? To make you mm -hmm. think a little bit, because, you know, causal nets, right, to AI. So so maybe, you know, they stand at the core of AI, right? As, as Yuda Paul is saying, but maybe or not, right? So. There's this vagueness, um, but yeah, I think that's kind of where you, where you had it, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, I think, uh, yes, so let's thank Mate for the wonderful talk again. So I also thank everyone for showing up. Thank you very much, man. Bye, see you, Mate. Bye, Mate. Bye. Thank you.